Welcome and bonjour! Welcome back to our exploration of the history of the United States since 1877. Today we start the class in earnest in that year 1877, which is a cutoff between the two surveys taught at my institution and at many institutions around the US. Why 1877, you might ask? Why not say 1876, which would have been the first 100 year anniversary of the Declaration of Independence? Well, there's a reason for it. It is the end of what is called Reconstruction in U.S. history, meaning the period after the Civil War where Union troops occupied the South and were dealing with the after effects of the Civil War. That occupation of the South ended in 1877, and that's what marks the beginning of a new age referred to as the Gilded Age in U.S. history. It matters a lot because a lot of the issues that were agitating Americans earlier in the 19th century are no longer as prominent in U.S. history. What was the big issue of the 19th century? Well, slavery, of course. If you study the first half of that course, you would have plenty of disputes, such as a dispute over the Mason-Dixon line, bleeding Kansas, the Fugitive Slaves Act, whether to admit new states that would be slave states or free states. All of these issues are gone now, because from 1861 to 1865, the United States fought the Civil War, and as a result, slavery is abolished and no longer returns, at least not in official form, to the United States. So that's no longer an issue that we will be studying in the class after that. It does not mean, however, that all the issues dealing with race will disappear. After slavery was abolished in the South, there is an effort to reinstate racial hierarchies through other means, whether it's mass incarceration, or segregationist laws known collectively as the Jim Crow laws, or through sheer intimidation with the rise of the KKK, or summary forms of justice known as lynching. So we will talk in the class about issues of racial discrimination, specifically as we get to the civil rights movement in the 1960s, uh, but slavery per se will not occupy us for now. The other big issue in the 19th century would have been westward expansion. Uh, the United States went from being a set of 13 colonies on the eastern coast to acquiring Florida from Spain, Louisiana from Napoleon, the southwestern U.S. taken from Mexico, and then some border disputes solved along the border with Canada uh, with Great Britain. So a lot of terms that you would hear if you study the early part of U.S. history, such as Manifest Destiny, the Louisiana Purchase, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, all of these will not preoccupy us today. In fact, the very westward expansion was coming to an end in the late 19th century because Americans were simply running out of room. What was called the frontier, according to the Bureau of the Census, was the area of settlement with a very low density of population where settlers were just moving in. And throughout the 19th century, the Bureau of the Census had kind of drawn a line to say this is how far white settlers uh, from the eastern part of the U.S. have gotten to. Well, in the 1890 census, I remember that the Bureau of the Census does a big counting of the U.S. population every 10 years, the Bureau announced that it could not quite figure out where the frontier was anymore uh, because every part of the United States had been settled, more or less. So that is the event known as the closing of the frontier. And that really marked the beginning and after in U.S. history. Frederick Jackson Turner, who was a major U.S. historian, addressed the American Historical Association, that's the annual big gathering of people teaching American history, like myself, and he delivered a narration that they uh, later published as The Significance of the Frontier in American History. That's in 1893. And in it, he announced that the frontier had completely influenced U.S. history and especially the national character because Americans, as he saw them, had been settlers who had moved west and so they had to be optimistic, hard-working, individualistic, and all these would shape the way the American character was in reference to, say, the European character. So the frontier and the past had been very important in shaping who Americans were, but notice that this is a historian talking that the frontier is no longer something that people are experiencing anymore. Now this is something that historians are talking about. This is something from the past. Increasingly, as the 19th century progresses, more and more people are living in big urban centers from New York to Chicago. The battles against Native Americans in the West are also coming to an end. You have, of course, that 
famous victory, a little big horn in 1876, but more and more, the Native Americans are pushed away from their lands and into reservations, or even at the tragic event, wounded knee, massacred altogether, including women and children. So we will not talk about all these issues in the class, where there is slavery, westward expansion, or the status of Native Americans. These belong more in a 19th century history course. We will talk about other things. So what are these new issues that are agitating Americans after 1877 during the period known as the Gilded Age? Well, Gilded comes from gold, from money. So clearly money is something that is of importance. And indeed, this is a period known as the Industrial Revolution, which had occurred earlier in Great Britain, about 100 years earlier, uh, but the United States would be more mid to late 19th century. An industrial revolution simply means that you shift from an economy based on agriculture to one based on industry. From mom and pop operations of craftsmen working in their shop to big operations, a factory system with thousands of employees. From people doing every part of the manufacturing to an assembly line process where people only do a minute portion. From an economy based on small investments to huge investments, much more based on capital from an economy that was reliant on animal power or horsepower to one based on steam power. From an economy where transportation was local and very expensive because you use an ox cart to one where transportation was much cheaper and much more massive due to the installation of the railroads. So you know the story. And this economic takeoff for the United States would really happen in the late 19th century. And this is a time when the United States, that used to be a minor player on the world stage, really took off. That graph that you're looking at shows the GDP, meaning the production of various areas of the world as a share of the world GDP. And you notice that as of, I don't know, 1700 to 1800, the US, shown in green here, was a very minor portion of the world economy compared with places like, say, China or India. But as the 19th century progresses towards the end and going into the early 20th century, uh, the U.S. share of the world economy skyrocketed, uh, nearing almost 50% at the end of World War II. So we're looking at the initial takeoff there in that graph. And that's especially remarkable if you look at things like the production of uh, cotton textile, or railroads, or steel. Uh, these are the big items of the industrial age. So why is it that the United States takes off as opposed to the other places that you see on that GDP chart. Well, uh, it's a capitalist economy, so obviously you need to have capital. And the United States was awash in it. Uh, that's during that period that the word millionaire comes into being, and back in the day when a million dollars was a lot of money. You go from an economy back in the earlier 19th century where people are mostly farmers, so the level of inequality between a rich farmer and a poor farmer is fairly limited to an era where some people can make a million dollars, and so now you have to have a word for it. Many of these originated during the Civil War, as people had manufactured weapons and such, so they are war profiteers, and when the war ends, they shift their capital from making cannons to making railroad. When there's not enough money available locally, plenty of it is invested from more mature economies, especially Britain, which is a very rich country in the late 19th century and has plenty of money to burn, and many British investors invest their money wisely or not, in American stocks such as railroad companies in the US. In the same way that nowadays people in Wall Street that are running out of places to invest in would flock to China to buy stocks in Alabama or something. Well, the United States in the late 19th century, it is the China of today, the rapidly growing economy that a lot of foreign investors uh, bring cash in. What else do you need to produce goods uh, well, you need natural resources. This is the era of steel, which requires coal and iron. And you also need coal in order to make steam-powered engine. So at that point, it's just a matter of luck. Do you have it or do you not? And as it happened, the United States happened to have a lot of natural resources. Whether it's coal mines, iron mines, copper, oil, you name it. All the basic ingredients for the industrial takeoff are found in the U.S. But I don't want to say that this is a be-all and end-all of economic takeoff. Uh, those of you who have taken my World History course know that plenty of countries that had a lot of economic potential, including natural resources like, say, China or the Congo in Africa, did not take off in the late 19th century for other reasons. So having plenty of uh, 
oil and coal and iron is not sufficient to make you a rich country. What else do you need? Well, people. You need workers. As it happened, the United States had plenty of those by the late 19th century. You have a lot of natural growth within the population because this is a time when American medicine improves, vaccines are introduced on a large scale, people inspired by Louis Pasteur in France discover germs and learn how to wash their hands, there's an effort in sanitation to uh, limit the spread of cholera and so forth. So naturally people start to live longer and you have natural growth. Beyond that, the plenty of workers come from overseas. This is one of the eras in US history where immigration is at its highest. If you look at that graph, you'll see a peak around the year 1900 and then another peak, which would be nowadays. So plenty of workers to come from. That means that wages have a tendency to go down. If you're a lot of workers and not enough jobs for every money, uh, so working conditions tend to be bad. But if you're a businessman looking for workers that will work for cheap, that's the time to be in. Plenty of Italian Americans, Polish Americans, and so forth, landing in New York City, Ellis Island every day. The other way to have economic growth is to do more with your resources. That you already have your capital, you have a set amount of labor, but you manage to extract more value from them, and that is called productivity. The way to do it is through technological progress. And this early age is a period where you have a lot of technological progress. This is a time uh, for all these famous inventors that are household names even today, uh, whether it's uh, Thomas Edison or Alexander Graham Bell, the inventors of the light bulb and the telephone respectively, and plenty of other uh, famous inventions. These are well protected under US law at the time. You have a patent system that works pretty well, so you can invest in uh, different technologies knowing that you will reap rich rewards from them. And Edison was very aggressive in pushing his patents. So what does that mean in terms of productivity? Well, imagine for a second that a light bulb shows up. If you are a businessman that was running a factory, well, normally you only used it half a day because at night it's dark and your workers go home. If you can now light up the whole factory, you can create a second shift where people work 12 hours during the day and 12 hours at night. And from the same amount of capital invested, that same factory, you can now double the productivity because you'll have two shifts during the day and at night. Beyond that, in order to have a successful economy, you need customers. You need to have domestic demand. In that regard, the late 19th century was rather closed as a market because you have a high tariff wall that is set uh, by Congress. And a tariff is whatever tax you pay on imported products. And people are divided over whether you need to have high tariffs or low tariffs. Uh, economists generally prefer to have low tariffs because they don't like the concept of the competition ever since the days of Adam Smith and David Ricardo and other early economic thinkers. But you do have other economists that think that at a time when an economy is just taking off, uh, it is good to protect that nascent industry uh, with high tariff walls because your domestic manufacturers are not quite yet able to compete with foreign competitors. And so it's nice, like a baby, that you have to teach how to walk and you want to protect that baby. And that's definitely what the US economy is at the time. And then in the 20th century, when the US economy became much stronger and able to compete against foreign manufacturers, uh, then the trade barriers had a tendency to go down. And then the United States was insisting that other countries uh, lower their tariff barrier now that the US was more productive, but not so during the Gilead age. So you combine all of that and you have all the recipe for industrial growth. What are the implications of that industrial growth? Well, quite a bit. And in fact, the whole section that we're going to have will be about the politics of the Gilded Age. And you'll see the many ways in which the rise of industrial power will impact all sorts of sectors in American political life. Well, for one thing, if you have more workers and those workers are now working in big factories in Chicago, New York, as opposed to small mom and pop operation in the countryside, they might want to organize themselves and you have the right of the union movement. Some of the earlier trade unions would be the Knights of Labor created in 1869 and then the more famous American Federation of Labor created in 1886. This is the first half of what is called now the AFL-CIO, the largest union in America. The second half CIO would be created in the 1930s. So we'll talk about that when we get to the New Deal. These tended to be met for specialized employees with a craft, welders, railroad engineers and the like. And they would be kind of the elite of the workforce that would bank together, sometimes secretly because the Supreme Court was very conservative and often treated trade unions as if they were secret conspiracies and that they had to be banned as a way to protect big business. 
So labor relations in the Gilded Age tended to be tense, that the workers were often paid as a subsistence wage, they thought they were not making enough, especially at a time in the Gilded Age where you have millionaires and a huge gap between the rich and the poor. And the way that they would protect their interests if you organize labor is that you go on strike. Those strikes were a bit more violent than the one that you will see today where some people will be uh, holding a, a sign that says honk if you support Proposition 9 or something like that. Uh, they would often involve actually battles because the workers don't want scabs, meaning workers that don't want to go with a strike, to go and work at the factory, so they will be intimidated. And to keep the factory open and to protect the scabs, then the uh, employers would hire some goons uh, to go and beat up the demonstrators and those demonstrators will then fight back and you have actual riots. Uh, the most famous was the Haymarket riot in May of 1886, uh, which involved some tremendous violence. I forgot what the death toll was, but you're talking several policemen and then brutal repression among the crowd uh, that led to many, many deaths. Notice the date, May. This is what eventually led worldwide to the Day of Labor from France, where I come from, to Russia and many other places. This is when Labor Day is celebrated, May 1st, every year. For some reason, the only country in the world that does not do Labor Day in May is the United States that does it in late August, even though that's the country where the first May celebration happened as part of the hay market riot. I don't know the answer for that. The late 19th century is also a time when a new ideology appears first in Germany, and that would be communism first pioneered by Karl Marx, a German philosopher. And we'll get back to communism again when we get to the Cold War, uh, but in a nutshell, this will be uh, an ideology based on sharing things, communism, and abolishing private property, defending the rights of the working class, the proletariat, and overthrowing the rich, the bourgeoisie, to set up a dictatorship of the proletariat. So something very, very much at odds with the American free market capitalist democracy as it existed in the late 19th century, and so very threatening to the possessing classes of the time. Especially since communists by the late 19th century are quite organized, they had set up something called the Second International, international as in an international organization of all communist parties worldwide to start the worldwide revolution. So they were on the march. This movement eventually led to the creation of the Socialist Party in the United States, one of his more famous leaders during that period was a man called Eugene Victor Debs, who is actually French-American, also another French immigrant. And he ran for president five times altogether, if I recall well. Uh, the high water mark for him was the 1912 election, where he got about 5% of the vote, which is the most, I think, for any socialist party candidate for president ever. So that gives you an idea of the strengths of the socialist party. Uh, while well, strengths up to 5%, that's their high water mark, so never enough to carry the polls. And in fact, the Socialist Party in the US uh, was never quite as strong as, uh, say, in France, Britain, Germany, other countries. Uh, some people at the time attributed that to the high level of upward social mobility uh, in the United States society. That because there was a way to go up in the ranks and uh, access to private property, uh, then the working class was not as willing to explode everything through a revolution. I'll let you ponder why there's no strong communist party in the US versus similar industrial societies. What is uh, the other consequence of the industrial revolution? Well, you now have a big, powerful business class, all the captains of industry, the robber barons. And numerically, they are not that many, but they are powerful and they are rich and they are influential because politics in the late 19th century were very corrupt, so they can buy their way into power. So they tended to dominate American politics during that era, and they were behind one of the leading movements that we'll study in the next lecture, and that would be the conservative movement, which is essentially the, the pro-business side of American politics, what a country club Republican would be today. Another consequence of the rise of industry would be the decline of the other big sector of the American economy, and that would be agriculture which was a major change because since the beginning of American settlement, agriculture had been the big thing, either voluntary agriculture in the terms of the settlers or involuntary through slavery on plantations in the South. And Thomas Jefferson, who himself was a planter from the South, had uh, created what was called the Jeffersonian ideal, that to him, America was a democracy, or at least independent, rich, white men like he was, because it was composed of independent farmers. And so you have great equality between farmers, again, as long as they're not slaves, 
and those uh, farmers would be hardworking, independent, and that's what made American democracy strong. Well, uh, that changes in the late 19th century. The number of farmers declines compared with the number of workers. Their political power also declines, and also their income declines uh, because you have a glut of products on the market and generally deflation, meaning prices going down in the agricultural sector. So they're pretty unhappy about that and eventually launch a big political movement called the People's Party or the Populist Party. And that will be the topic for another lecture that we have. That's the other big party from that era. Another big consequence of the rise of industry in the late 19th century is that those big robber barons or captains of industry, they corrupt the American political system. They pay out politicians and they set up party machines in big cities. That led to high levels of corruption. And some reformers in the big cities tend to complain about that, that American democracy is in danger. And that's the ancestor of all these reformers that want to use the power of government uh, to correct the ills in American society. So these are the various topics that we will study in the next few lectures. Next time we will start with conservatives. Au revoir and see you next time.